to dream the impossible dream. We thought it was never going to happen, Luby. This uh, seemed inconceivable, preposterous, absolutely outrageous to consider that not only would South Florida, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, I guess you can include Palm Beach and then the rest of the hillbilly state, would have hockey here, but uh, not only that, have two teams and then have two teams that may end up each with at least one Stanley Cup. We're right around the corner there, Real Luby. I completely whiffed on this thing, though. I really did. I was tempted to pull the trigger on 11-1 to on the Panthers to sweep the series. Oh, yeah. Right. Seemed improbable, but the thought crossed my mind. That's about as far as it got. And then, of course, I'm thinking if they win the series, which everybody in the universe had the Panthers in six, I, I think even Connor McDavid might have made a bet. There'll be an investigation through Watani's interpreter, who's now going to be in jail. I think he even made a bet of Panthers and six. It, it was universal. It, it was a given. But if the Panthers are going to win the series, you had to think that uh, Sergei Bobrovsky would be the obvious choice as the MVP, unless somebody went off and scored like 20 goals. But uh, it's sort of an even distribution of scoring for the Florida Panthers. Everybody's making a contribution. In fact, that's the big difference in this series. And it also happens to be the defining factor in the Boston-Dallas Mavericks series that the Panthers have any number of somewhat interchangeable parts. Yes, they have their elite players at the top, like Sergey, uh, like Sasha Barkov, but uh, and Ryan Hart had over 50 goals this year, and, and Bennett is a big-time scorer. But you can go down the roster to the fourth line, and uh, it's not that much of a drop-off. Everybody's uh, capable of doing uh, what needs to be done inside the system. And you could say the same thing for Boston. They go four or five deep in guys that can be the major contributor every night. Unfortunately for Dallas, they go too deep, and one of their guys is half crippled, and the other guy has lost his eyesight all of a sudden. <laughs> so I was going to cash maybe. I mean, I'd be in a perfect hedge-off situation if I had the Panthers to sweep at 11-1. All I'd have to do is uh, bet on Edmonton in the next game, and I'm going to make a score no matter what. And Bobrovsky at 4-1 to one looks like a cinch. Now, if you were betting, I hope you went ahead and did it. We give you the opportunity every day to bet online. That's your number one choice and number one source for NBA Finals and Stanley Cup playoffs this season, but uh, both look like they're going to end pretty soon. Every stat, every matchup, even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. When the game's over, head on over to our online casino. Get in on a game of blackjack or poker. Unwind with one of our over 150 slot games. Head to the website today to get in on all the action. Use the promo code BELIEVE. That's all caps, B-L-E-A-V, all one word, all caps, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online. The game starts here. Well, it looks like it ends here, uh, Luby. I hope you're feeling pretty comfortable about this thing. 3 nothing in hockey is not insurmountable. It's been done before. 3 nothing in basketball has never been overcome. So uh, you have uh, the Celtics on the uh, precipice of maybe sweeping Dallas uh, right out of the uh, arena tonight and winning the championship. Uh, they'd have gone 16-2 and in the postseason. Not too shabby. And maybe put an end to Kaibosh on the rhetoric that the West was so vastly superior. Although we'll get to that in a second because it looks like Boston certainly got the best of shakes in terms of the draw. Yeah, it's one of those things where some upstart knocks out Djokovic in the second round and uh, you, you were supposed to face the guy in the third yeah. round, but yeah. now you don't have to. You pretty much have a walkover because this guy will never be able to duplicate his performance. And um, it, it looks like uh, the Boston Celtics are really caught a nice – uh, the path of least resistance, you would have yes, to say, to yes. the championship. Uh, yes. Now, the Panthers, on the other hand, I mean, let, let's go back and track the history of this. Uh, professional sports kind of hit the South Florida landscape almost all at once. So you go back to 1966, the Miami Dolphins, these brave young men, here to play a child's game. And they've been a very successful franchise. But it's like they said in Goodfellas, Karen, that was all we had. That was all we had when she flushed a Coke down the toilet there in uh, Goodfellas and uh, Ray Liotta is going crazy, realizing, my God, I'm fucked. <laughs> so we had the Dolphins. Uh, that was it. Uh, the Miami Hurricane football team started to make some noise. Uh, there was no basketball team then. Uh, we were pretty much bereft uh, of major league sports uh, here in South Florida, certainly on a professional level. And uh, the Heat came along in 1988. And, and then around 93, uh, we ended up with uh, both the Florida Marlins and the Florida Panthers at the time. They're now known as the Miami Marlins, but they may as well be known as the next team to be contracted because it's absolutely the worst arrangement of players and uh, the most pathetic franchise that, that we have ever seen, despite the fact that they have two World's Championships. 1997-2003, I mean, in the span of six years, this pathetic franchise. The only people that succeeded in baseball 
in South Florida where two of the previous owners, I, I guess you could count David Sampson among the ownership since he was the son-in-law of Jeffrey Loria, who was this bogus Fugazi art dealer who was selling Dayglo Jesus paintings underneath the highway. Next thing you know, he buys a team, even though he doesn't have any money. All of his former partners from the Montreal Expo sue him in federal court. He comes out on top, and even though he didn't own the shirt on his back, ends up scoring one point two. what was it, $1.3, $1.2 billion yeah. when he sells a franchise to this complete fool, Bruce Sherman. And he, he would be, uh, I guess, the poster child for the idea that how can guys be so smart in business and so fucking stupid when it comes to owning sports franchises? Remember, we got into that fight uh, with the owner of the Rockets there. Uh, he wasn't real happy that we uh, put forth that contention, e even though we did it under the graces and the auspices of, well, uh, it was Tillman for Tito, right? And yes. uh, he, he, he just almost hung up the phone on us, uh, started insulting us because we said, well, you don't fall into this category. Yeah, but how come all these uh, sports businessmen are just so fucking dumb? And, and he uh, comes right back with, yeah, how many teams do DJs own? <laughs> That's the point in the interview where you really just want to say, hey, tell me, I know you're filthy fucking rich. Go fuck yourself. Right. Uh, and that's it. But, but we never thought it was going to work. I mean, uh, there, there was speculation uh, that, uh, you know, the only ice that anybody was familiar with in South Florida was the ice in the bottom of a martini glass. And uh, that was pretty much true. The franchise uh, caught the attention of the fans because uh, they were decent in their first couple of expansion years. This is one thing that the NHL does well at this point, although they might be inclined to change because it has been a successful formula where they don't subject the fans of expansion teams to 10 years of complete dysfunctional misery. They, they give them a shot to actually be good, and we've seen it happen a couple of times now with uh, the Seattle Kraken wearing half band, the Las Vegas Golden Knights wearing Stanley Cup finals like in, the, what, year two? Yeah. Uh, they were unbelievable. Uh, did they make it their first year? I, I don't know. They, they really give the uh, expansion teams a chance. Uh, it was uh, some clever uh, uh, personnel decisions uh, where these grizzled veterans uh, combined to uh, make the Florida Panthers uh, somewhat relevant in, in the first couple of years, and then they make the Stanley Cup final in year number three, and we're thinking, my God, I mean, this is, this is going to be great. And then you talk about being mired in sub-mediocrity. That's where the franchise was at. They got their new building, which is supposed to always be the panacea of success for all teams that are failing and floundering and are face down in the gutter. That Does it work, Luby? Almost never. Pittsburgh, the Pirates, uh, how'd they do? Remember when uh, all that time, well, if we get a stadium. The Marlins, same, but well, if we get a yeah. stadium. Yeah, everybody says the same thing. And, and they're always going to do uh, tremendous uh, improvements to the surrounding area there, which is usually pretty decrepit because they were able to steal the land from the poor people to begin with. I mean, <laughs> it's history repeating itself. Only instead of happening uh, with, with ugliness and uh, all kinds of uh, cruelty to people, it's happening at the expense of municipalities. Uh, anyway, I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, you came along after uh, hockey was already somewhat entrenched here. We'll be uh, uh, being born in the early 80s. Uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, by the time you were uh, cognizant of what was going on in the world of sports, uh, we already had the team rolling. They, they made it to that Stanley Cup there in 96, 97, mm -hmm. and uh, then didn't make it back until uh, almost uh, 30 years later. And now they've been there back to back, and it looks like uh, they have uh, every opportunity. I, how can they blow this, uh, Louis? I don't know. I'm not getting it. I'm not thinking of those things. I don't. Again, as we saw last night, hockey is a fucking weird sport. So I very strange. I don't put anything past anyone. The one thing I'll give this team is, and it's why I'm glad. I'm glad they got the fourth goal. Is they don't stop. It's that's one thing that you can say for this team, and it's why I thought the Celtics could get in trouble because the Celtics do fuck around a little. The Panthers don't. <laughs> like, even in the games they've lost, they're right there until the last fuck. They've gotten down 4-2 in games and scored two goals in the third period. Like, and last time they got a 4-1 and <laughs> two of the most ridiculous goals you'll ever see they make it 4-3 and then they get allow another almost a close opportunity, but then they close the door. Right? They, they, they control the action from maybe the 15 or 14 minute mark of the first period, because again, they start slow until the end. And even after those two fucking goals, they never wavered. They never slowed down. They never gave up the puck. They keep coming. But again, uh, one goal, a guy, the Edmonton Oiler guy shoot it off the net. It wasn't even at the fucking net. It hit off the back of a Panther off of Bobrovsky into the net. The other one, the guy shot it, threw it in from the fucking blue line. I don't know what he was even doing. And, Fucking like our friend, the professor, likes to say, 
one of his teammates had to stick out. I don't, I, he may have purposely done it. I don't know. It was fucking weird. He had to stick just sitting there. It hits the stick and goes into the fuck. Like when the, and they had point blank opportunities all night. And Bobrovsky was like a fucking ballet dancer. They get two goals on the biggest bunch of bullshit you would ever see. So I, who fucking knows? I don't know. I, I don't know. There was a hard, hard to imagine they lose four straight, though. I don't see it. But again, because they seem to be better than Edmonton. They, they just do. Either that better. or they're, uh, you know, really lucky. But that, that relentless pressure they put on. Everything. And uh, as you say, uh, the resiliency, the stats keep popping up, although it didn't hold up last night because they gave up the couple of goals in the third period that made the game tight. And and I always love the last minute, the frantic buzzing around the net there when there's an empty net on the other end. And uh, every moment you, you have your, uh, you know, heart in your throat <laughs> thinking, wow, what a way to lose this would be from uh, up 4 one. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, strange things happen. Uh, no doubt about it. Uh, you saw Edmonton clearly dominate game number one. And they end up losing 3 nothing, the widest margin of uh, defeat that they've uh, suffered so far in the three games. And, uh, and at this point, you would have to say that uh, well, whatever it is that Paul Maurice has designed, if you can actually sort of uh, define and uh, quantify uh, certain systems and plays in, in, in hockey, uh, it's working. Whatever it is, it's working. It's better than what uh, Chuck Knobloch over there on the other side. Is that the guy that was a former baseball player? Oh, what, what is his name? Mark Knobloch? I'm not even Something sure. Something Knobloch. Yeah, I don't know the first name. I, I just see him, like, getting the ball at second base and throwing it into the stands. Uh, Knobloch had uh, Steve Blast disease there for a while. He looked like Steve Sachs in there. But by the way, too, uh, just uh, going back to our reference of the uh, Marlins and, and what a bogus Fugazi sports town South Florida has been forever. Uh, the... Uh, Biggest Ponzi scheme in sports history it was pulled off by Jeffrey Lurie and David Sampson. Uh, literally, think about that. They had no money, and they ended up with billions. <laughs> <laughs> and the team was shit the entire time. Yeah, yeah. Incredible, man. I mean, so so that that's what we've been dealing with. Uh, it does seem odd that we're uh, on the uh, precipice of winning a championship here with, with the Florida Panthers. And at, at this point, I would have to say, for uh, the way the franchise has turned around, they got new ownership several years back with a guy that had some substantial gelt and also had a lot of luck, Vinny Viola. No relation to Frank Viola, the former pitcher. But uh, he came in, and he was like a West Point guy, and he's always honoring the military. But uh, he had tremendous success in horse racing also. as uh, He's had a couple of Kentucky Derby winners. I mean, the guy buys two horses. If I buy them, they're in Central Park or on their way to some glue factory. This guy buys a couple of horses, and boom, they're in a winner's circle there, and they run for the roses. So, so. Uh, that, that looks pretty good. That That's happening. Now, now uh, usually it goes the other way in this uh, circumstance. Uh, talking about and zeroing in on the U.S. Open here for a sec. Rory McIlroy is sharing the lead. Now, uh, the thing with McIlroy that, that's remarkable is that he's gone, uh, I guess, what would it be? Like 40 majors without a win? And this was a kid that, uh, you know, he, he looked like he was going to threaten Big Jack's record at one time. 2014, he wins the U.S. Open, and he hasn't won one uh, a major since. That was it. That, that's 10 years. That's incredible I mean, when you think about it because he has played good golf uh, all throughout. He's always a solid contender. Any tournament that he enters, uh, all golfers go through their spells or ups and downs. But his uh, down periods seem to have been extremely brief. And uh, every time he's in a tournament, you're thinking, yeah, McElroy, he has a shot to win. But uh, then th this, this never worked for me. It was just the opposite. Whenever uh, I uh, considered uh, going back to the wife who I was having problems with, uh, and there have been several. Uh, usually it uh, was a catastrophic maneuver. And I always had the best of times between marriages. And here's McElroy supposedly tapping this uh, absolute stunning babe with a tremendous personality that's on CBS, Amanda Balionis, who just consequently, right around the time that Rory files for divorce, has ditched her wedding ring and rumors of their relationship uh, blooming into a hot and uh, just sweaty romance. Uh, start to really uh, proliferate themselves uh, and permeate themselves all over the place. And then all of a sudden he, he uh, rescinds his uh, filing for divorce with, with his wife and they're getting back together like this week and he's on top of the world. That doesn't it work in just the opposite direction. You, you've had this experience also in between marriages. Uh, I remember you were having the time of your life, Loopy. Yeah, the exactly. time of your life. I still remember that station wagon rocking back and forth in the, uh, uh, valet driveway uh, to the Ocean Manor Hotel, and, and, and who pops out? I'm thinking, wow, that car is uh, about to uh, just, uh, you know, flip out and start, you know, uh, running on its own. And, and sure enough, 
Who pops out with a big smile on his face? Mike Luby Lubitz with some bait. Unbelievable. <laughs> but wouldn't you find that the decision to go back to the wife is, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't root against anybody being happy, and uh, people have their problems. And certainly with a guy that's in the international spotlight to the uh, level, the extreme that Rory McIlroy is, I mean, uh, he's one of those guys, too, that he passes gas, and everybody's trying to figure out that they assemble a panel with uh, Brandon Chamley uh, saying, uh, well, here's what I think he had for lunch. <laughs> Talk about minutia. But, uh, yeah, so so good. I mean, is that not a reverse? Uh, it's kind of uh, something that would make you embrace the idea of uh, rekindling the romance, Luby, where uh, I usually think uh, the first reaction should be run as fast as you can. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a log jam, the proverbial log jam atop the leaderboard there and uh, still uh, wide open uh, and uh, very much undecided. The U.S. Open, which uh, I do have uh, a little taste on uh, Bryson DeChambeau, the freak who uh, lurks in the background there. I think two shots off the pace. So uh, in, in pretty good shape. How, how do you get DeChambeau at 20 to 1? That, that's the beauty of betting golf. Going to bet online. Yes. Man, start present. Yeah. Yep. Start sending it in. And the good thing, too, is you can. You talk about hedging. You can hedge on every round. You, you can bet every shot now. <laughs> it's incredible. It's only a matter of time before we uh, separate everybody from their capital. But uh, th there's going to have to be, never mind uh, bailing out people on student loans. It's going to be on debts from parlays. Is parlay uh, a French word for your fucked, Luby? Is that possible? <laughs> I wouldn't be you can get a French-English dictionary there. Look up the word parlay. I guarantee you it says that, that means that you're fucked. It, it, it's incredible. All right, uh, Celtics up 3-0. They're they closing out tonight. Mike Luby Lubitz, what do you think? Porzingis, uh, question mark. Boom. He's like Matthew Lesko, the guy with the question marks on the jacket many years ago. Hey, I can get you government money to open up a coffee shop in the middle of fucking nowhere. Thank you, man. <laughs> I believe you're a man of great credibility, and I'm going to go ahead and dial that number on the screen right now and buy your book. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Fantastic. But, uh, yeah, I mean, what do you think? Uh, is there any question? Yeah, uh, I mean, you you, you, you I always think the team's going to get the token game, right? Yes. I Well, again, the way the last game went, the Mavs controlled most of it. Boston went on a run, and then the Mavs soon after went on their own run and stayed in it the rest of the game. The Luca getting the Luca fouling out thing is the kind of thing I think that you 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 would think would give the Mavs enough motivation to get one. Like Luca came out and openly said he was pissed. He thought it was ridiculous. He thought the officiating. He said whatever he was allowed to say without going overboard. Um, I I feel like he has his best game. I feel like they have their best game. I think they get a game. I don't see him going much further than that. But I, I don't see the sweep uh, in that series. And we're not going to be back. I don't think until there's another game in the Panthers. I don't know what to do with that series because the Panthers, even in the game that they got dominated, they still had the better opportunities and they cashed in and that's why they won three nothing. And they have had the better goaltending clearly the entire series. And then every other game they dominated the next two games. I don't know why that would change. That's the one thing I'll give again, like I start, started, I'll give this some credit. They, a lot of time when you get up and that's the thing, cause it didn't go from four, one to four, three, because the Panthers loafed. It was the opposite. Like they weren't playing keep away. They kept their aggression. They control. They had way more. Uh, they had way better and way more opportunities than the Oilers in that whole stretch when they were up 4-1. The Oilers just got the stupid ass goals. So to me, it's like if they're controlling the game, they're dominating and they don't rest on their laurels. I, I, it's, it's hard for me to see why they can't sweep. I just, I don't know. It, it, you're in Canada. The, the, they called a couple of penalties yesterday that I didn't understand. 11-1, Luby. So, uh, you, you realize I will not stop talking about passing on the opportunity to bet this sweep <laughs> at 11 to 1. And then on top of that, if I had been enough money on this, uh, I would go ahead and buy a thousand tickets for this game. And Edmonton, they're, they're all depressed there. Uh, did you see how quickly uh, they deflated everybody in the arena last night? Edmonton, they were all jacked up. They're thinking, okay, uh, we'll beat our chest here. It'll be 2 1 after tonight. We'll come back, tie the series. And then it's game on, too. Yep. And after it got to be 3 1 and then 4 1 very quickly uh, after yeah. that. I mean, these guys were ready to just suck on some whale blubber, weren't they? Do they sell whale blubber at the uh, concession stands there? Imagine. I yeah, I'll have the uh, blubber. No, the platter, not the sandwich. <laughs> the Get the fuck out of here. What are we talking about? <laughs> Edmonton Oilers. All right, they're, they're done. Uh, but I, I will be uh, buying 1,000 tickets, planning people in the uh, arena on when is the game? Sunday night? Yeah, I, I presume. Sunday night, or it might be Saturday night. But so uh, whenever the game is, um, I, I, I will have every time Bobrovsky twitches his nose, I will have these thousand people chanting MVP, MVP. 
So maybe I can top that at four to one also. That, that would be a nice major score. All right, we have to get out of here. I hope you guys uh, have a great weekend. Uh, going to be a lot of fun. It's been soggy here in South Florida. And in fact, uh, never mind, uh, you know, talking about the impossible dream with the Florida Panthers. Uh, the real song of the day here in South Florida goes all the way back to Eric Burden and the Animals, uh, one of the uh, British pop invasion groups that came along around the time of the Beatles and the Zombies and uh, all of these other Rolling Stones, all these great British bands, the Who. And uh, the simple song uh, that we'll leave you with here, uh, and, and it's true about South Florida right now, even though we may have the Stanley Cup sitting here in town in, in just a couple of days, we got to get out of this place. <laughs> if it's the last thing we, I mean, it, it is soaking wet here, people. Yeah, raining again. Far be it from us to complain about uh, any of this stuff, because uh, in general we enjoy some pretty fantastic weather. It's paradise. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, once you get, I mean, you know, in the summertime, you almost feel like the guys on Deadliest Catch uh, on a day when the seas are coming up in the Bering Sea. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, I mean, you got to just sit it out, but whatever. I mean, you, you have to deal with it. But uh, uh, unusual amounts of torrential rain have hit a couple of areas, and then they realize, hey, we forgot to plan for drainage. <laughs> people are literally like driving their cars into canals thinking they're making a right turn into a garage it, it, it's insane what's going on down here so we got to get out of this place and we got to get out of here thanks so much for tuning in we'll catch you again on monday another edition uh, from michael luby lubitz i'm jeff deforest catch you monday with the next edition of the morning briefing 